All right, so I've just finished something pretty cool. You might have come here after watching it, or you might have just seen the title. I created a VR lyric video for the first Stream Beats original track, Kill It Anyway. And I really like it. If you haven't watched it, pause this video, don't even close the tab, but go find that, watch it. It's really fun to watch on mobile, or if you have a VR headset, check it out in that. And then you can head back here to learn a little more about it. And that's what I want to do. I'm going to walk through the bare bones step to create a VR or 360 degree video in DaVinci Resolve. I'm going to go over a few of the specific techniques I use in my video, and then I'm going to cover some general information about working in VR or 360 degrees. And in fact, let's start there. General VR 360 degree video advice. Good luck. <laughs> um, I had a little bit of a hard time putting this all together. It pushed my computer system to the brink multiple times, and I even bent my rules for this channel a little bit, and partway through the project, I migrated and started working in Fusion Studio, the standalone version of Fusion. But everything I did can be done in the free version of DaVinci Resolve. I moved to Fusion Studio in hopes of having a little bit more of a stable working environment, especially on my computer, but you absolutely can make custom VR videos for free in DaVinci Resolve. One giant factor in performance and how long it will take to process and render your video is resolution. 360 degree video can have almost absurdly high resolution because it has to spread those pixels completely around the viewer. I made my videos the maximum resolution I could export out of the free version of DaVinci Resolve and that was 3840 by 1920. 3840 pixels wide being the maximum horizontal resolution I could export and then the vertical resolution was dictated by something Something else in the process, but we'll get to that soon. If you're just experimenting or don't care that much about having the highest quality export, you can absolutely pull down that resolution and you'll have a much easier time of the whole process. But for now, let's get into the bare bone basics of how to create a 360 degree video inside DaVinci Resolve. And we're gonna start here on the edit page. I already have a timeline set up and this is a standard full HD 1920 by 1080 timeline. If you have a specific piece of footage you want to integrate into your 3D scene, you can drag that into the timeline or you can go to the effects library, effects, and drag fusion composition onto your timeline and extend it to the duration you want your video to be. Then with your playhead over your clip or over this fusion composition, you're gonna open this button to open the fusion page. Now, if you've watched some of my other videos or know a little bit about fusion, you're aware that it has a full 3D workspace. Let me demonstrate very plainly. I'm gonna click this button to create a shape 3D node. And I'm actually gonna click that two more times. So we have three of these shape 3D nodes and I'm gonna change them to a cube, a sphere, and a cylinder. And then I'm gonna press this button to create a merge 3D node. And we can drag from the square shape output on all of these shape 3D nodes into that one merge 3D node. And then with that merge selected, we're gonna click this button to create a render 3D node and connect that to our media out node. And then we're gonna select our merge 3D node and press one to pull it up in this first viewer. And it's a little close now, but if you hold middle mouse button and left mouse button and pull to the left, you will slide back and you'll see that you are in a 3D workspace. If you hold middle mouse button and right mouse button, you will pivot around the center of this workspace. And here, because we piped those three shape 3D merged into this, we have three objects all layered on top of each other. So I'm gonna select this first one, use these transform controls to shift this sphere over here. The second will be this cube on the far side and then the cylinder, we're gonna push back a little bit and then I'm even gonna pull this cube there and then we can pivot around and see that these are arranged in a loose circle or I guess triangle. And next we have the secret sauce that's gonna make this entire thing work. We're gonna press shift space to pull up this search bar that searches through all our available tools or our nodes. And we're gonna start to type spherical camera. And as soon as it pops up, we can click spherical camera and then click add. That will create this node and we can pipe that into our merge node as well. And in that 3D representation, you'll see this circle here and that is this spherical camera. But then we'll go to our media out node and press two to pull up that and you'll see something pretty interesting. Our 3D models are positioned completely around this camera. But here in this viewer, we can see all three of those objects at once. If I take that sphere, no matter where I move that sphere, 
it will always be visible on this second viewer. And that's because this is the raw output of that spherical camera. This is an entire 360 degree field of view represented in one frame. And because of that, as you move things around, you'll see them warp in interesting ways. If I were to take this sphere and move my camera, so then I can then pull it up in Y space and then position it directly over our spherical camera. In the second viewer, you'll see that this looks nothing like a cube anymore. It's stretched over the entire top edge of our frame. Now, while this view will be what we eventually export as our final file, the Fusion page has a pretty amazing tool to give you another option when working in this format. If we go up to these three dots above our viewer and go to 360 degree view and change that to lat long, we'll get a viewer and control similar to what you would see if you were to watch this 360 video on YouTube on a desktop. If I hold down my middle and right mouse button, then I can pivot around and you'll see we start looking at this circle, but as I pivot around, you see there's our cylinder. And now if I look straight up, you'll see that there is that square that we positioned directly above us and it looks like a square. So you have a few different options. You can work in the 3D workspace where you can see sort of an outward view and see where all your objects are in relation to your spherical camera. You can work in that stretched out and morphed view or you can look at your scene through the lens of the spherical camera and pivot around whenever you want. And really that's all there is to it. You create a simple 3D scene, you add a spherical camera, and the output of that gives you this warped two to one image that you can export and then upload to YouTube and anyone can view in VR. There are a few housekeeping items to take care of. First is resolution. When you add a spherical camera to your scene, it will automatically override the resolution settings in the renderer 3D node. If we select that render 3D node and in our inspector go to image, you'll see that the settings were the settings from our timeline, 1920 by 1080. But as soon as we added the spherical camera, you'll see that it changed this output to 3840 by 1920. The way this works is that the spherical camera takes your default horizontal resolution, it sets that to the vertical resolution, and then doubles it for your new horizontal resolution. So you end up with a two to one aspect ratio. But once that is set, we're only halfway there. Remember that we started on the edit page and that timeline is still set to our default 1920 by 1080 resolution. So we need to navigate back to the edit page in our media pool, find our timeline, right click, go to timelines, timeline settings, and under format, we need to change this resolution from 1920 to 1080 to 3840 by 19. 20, or whatever resolution you are working in, as long as the resolution on the Fusion page matches the edit page. The last bit of housekeeping has to do with after you actually export your final video. If I were to export this video as is and upload it to YouTube, anyone that watched it would just see this frame. In order for it to play back the way we want it to, we need to add metadata that tells Google that it is a 360 degree image. Luckily, this is super easy. Google has a free utility that you can download and when you run it, you can select your final clip and it will save a copy of that video with the appropriate metadata attached. Then you can upload that injected file to YouTube and it will just work. Anyone watching on a desktop will be able to drag the camera around. Anyone on a phone will be able to use the gyroscope in that camera to move around. And anyone watching on a headset will have total control over where they look while your video is playing. All right, time for some fun stuff. Let's take a look at some specific things I did in my VR Lyric video. I'm not going to completely break this down, but we are gonna to touch on some things that I thought were interesting or a little worthy of note. But first up, here is our node tree. It's a lot. <laughs> And I understand if this is beyond intimidating, but as I walk through some things, you'll be able to see a clear path here. And we're gonna start with our text, our lyrics. But spoiler alert first, the particles you see flying past the camera, those take a lot of work. Those are pretty hard to process. So while we talk about the text and maybe some other things, I'm gonna go in and I'm going to disconnect the connection for those particles. You'll see them disappear just so we can navigate a little easier. Okay. Lyrics. I'm here right at the first chorus and you'll see that we have this line of text, our lyrics, we feel betrayed. And that lives here on this text node. Now for every line of lyrics, we have a 2D text layer. I can pull that up on my first viewer. It's just this text. This mask coming into it is actually how this text transitions on. It has sort of this step pattern where a few letters will pop in and then a few more and then a few more. 
and then that's how it appears in frame. So we have that text and that text is attached to this image plane. I can pull that image plane up in the viewer and navigate to where I have it set. And you'll see that because everywhere we didn't have text was transparent, this is just floating in space now. So for each line of text, we have our text layer on an image plane and all of those are feeding into this one merge 3D node. And if I pull that up on my viewer, you'll see that this red line means this is keyframed. So let me explain this. We have all our text on individual 3D layers, and those layers are positioned in one long line in 3D space. The layers themselves aren't moving but all of them are piped into this one 3D merge node and that 3D merge we've keyframed to move. So we have a long trail of lyrics animated to pop up when it's appropriate. And we have that merge 3D that is just sliding and guiding all of them through our scene from the start of our video to the end. I did it this way because I thought it would just be overwhelming if we had individual keyframes for this 3D position on all of these 3D layers. And we have multiple different ways that our text is animated in. Those are all just different ways of animating in 2D text. We have a good bit of options because we are working in 2D. I'm not really sure if it would have been technically better or maybe more efficient to work with proper 3D text layers. I don't know, this is how I did it. It kind of worked. The only other thing I wanted to touch on with the text is this pretty cool fiery texture I have on a few words. I actually have another whole video all about this effect. I have a video where I recreate Dr. Disrespect's end screen and he has this really cool fiery effect going on over a few shapes and text. So if you're interested in creating a texture like this, check that out. But we're gonna go ahead and talk about these interesting rotating cubes. I don't know what to call it, but we're gonna talk about these. These live in this little tree here. So I'm gonna select this merge and pull it up in our second viewer. And you'll see that we have these two cubes. I can just preview them here, one and two. But you'll see that they have this texture that is the artwork for this track. But you also see something going on down here, and those are projectors. We have two copies of this artwork, and they are going into projectors. So we have two arrays, and you'll see that these are actually pointed at these cubes. Now these projectors work like projectors. If you have any 3D shapes in your scene, you can pipe an image or a video into this projector and it will project it correctly in 3D space. So we have those aiming at the cubes and as the cubes rotate, you get this interesting, subtle warping sometimes going on. And it's all natural. It's all as it would happen in real life. And the only other thing we have going on here is that all of that is going into this merge 3D node. And then we have set up a shake modifier on the position of this node on the Z axis. So it is randomly moving back and forward in time. So while our lyrics fly past and these particles soar by, these cubes are also randomly pulsing back and forth with the artwork of this track. And finally, let's talk about the particles. The particles are really cool. They kind of make this whole video, but it can be a little hard to work with particles and it can be hard on your computer. So I am going to reconnect all of our 3D layers here, preview that 3D merge, and then preview our out on this second screen. Particles in the Fusion page are a system unto themselves. And what this really means is that there are tons of nodes to affect how they work and spawn and all these other things. But at the end of that node tree for your particles, you have to have a P render node. That will get you a final visual or 3D product that you can use in the rest of your scene. And here I set up this ultra basic, as basic as you can get particle node with this AP emitter that spawns particles and then out to the P render node. And with this P emitter selected, you can see this cube here. That is where all of our particles are spawning and I'm giving them velocity to fly towards and past the camera. And the other things of note are here in style where I've set this style to line with some custom color controls as well. And even though I set this up as a line, you are not seeing this line here. These line particles are less than 2D, like they're points, but stretched out. They're meant to be viewed from a side and not really in this way. So after our P-Render node, we have a replicate 3D node. And this is crazy powerful. If we take our P-Render node and preview that up, you'll see the lines that our emitter is creating. They're not nearly as big. They're not nearly as visible as something we want. So out of that, we have this replicate node. And then also piping into that replicate, we have this shape 3D node. If I preview that, you'll see that it is just one long slim cylinder. 
and what this replicate node is doing. We are feeding into it this particle system, information that says where these particles are spawning, their velocity, where they're moving, and even the color. And then we are piping it this 3D shape. And it is taking this shape and replicating that shape and applying it to every location where we have a particle. And it's even taking that color data from the particles. So pulled up on my viewers now, I have the P render node on viewer one and the replicate node on viewer two. And you're seeing how big a difference this is. You can barely see this. You might not be able to see this with YouTube compression, but the replicate 3D node, we're pulling in those actual 3D cylinders so that when you watch this, especially when you watch in a VR headset, you feel that weight as these objects fly by you. I like this. And then we have all of these assets coming into this merge where we have that same spherical camera, which is going to our render out and then our media out, which is giving us this image. And now with all these things in the scene, you can really see how this is warping that image and you're getting a complete 360 degree field of view in this 2D image. And that is all I have for you today. If you've come this far, Thank you very much. I know already this will end up being a little bit of a long video, but I've tried to pack it full of useful information. I think in the world of VR or 360 degree video, lots of people are hung up on the cameras and I think that tech still has a decent way to go. But if you use all computer generated imagery like this, you can create pretty high quality 360 degree video. If any of you end up using these tools to create a video of your own, I would absolutely love to see it. Please drop a link in the comments below. And if you like this video, it's pretty much what I do on this channel. I dive into the corners of DaVinci Resolve and find really cool things like this. I would love to share more with you. I have tons planned for this year, so consider subscribing if you don't wanna miss out on any of that. Thanks, I'll see you next time.